Welcome to the Founder Video Podcast, an interview series bringing you the latest and greatest info on B2B marketing, revenue operations, and go-to-market strategy from respected experts. Here is your host, Will Martin. Okay, so we are back with another episode of the Founder Video Podcast. In this occasion, we have here with us Amelia Taylor, founder of the Revenue Table and go-to-market and revenue operations expert, most importantly for B2B SaaS has worked in many different places. We'll know more about it today. And that's actually the first question. But before, I just wanted to welcome you and appreciate you for coming over. Amelia, welcome. Ah, thank you. I was the worst with getting back to you when you reached out and I was like, okay. And I marked you and unread, like unread, I think three times. So I was like, I've got to respond to him because I want to join him big time. So we are here and I'm super excited to chat. Awesome. Awesome. So touching on the, on the first question that I was mentioning, right? Like who is Amelia Taylor? And this is a question that I've been asking to all of the guests. What do people need to know about your past in order to understand who you are today? Most importantly as a professional, but if you want to share some of the personal side of things too, that's completely fine. Absolutely. So I am a big believer in there being like so much depth to humans. And I know that a lot of people look at things at such a surface level. It's so easy to look at certain people and be like, oh, you got here because of X, Y, Z, or your father ran this. So now you're a part of this, or you have the look, or you've got the charisma, you know, sure. Do those things matter? Like does a charisma, does charisma matter in sales? Yeah. But do skills matter just as much? Absolutely. So I look at my life and a lot of things that people don't know about me, a lot of people do know, like I'm a single mommy of two daughters, seven and nine, who are their preacher's granddaughters, if that says anything, I'm a preacher's daughter. So therefore like they're hellions and then some, I expected that. And you know, I'll just dive in and share. When I was almost 15, I lost my mother. And so I learned what it was like to be present. Like that was something that was like naturally just poured into me of, how to be present with where you're at in the moment, like today. And I can't build and grow if I don't look at one stair at a time, not the whole entire staircase, because I want to jump to the top and get to where I want to go, but I can't do so. Nobody can do that, right? You know, nobody's like, you know, has these superpowers to do that, but maybe some people, not me. So I know if I don't look at one stair at a time and like conquer three things on it, I can't move to the next to keep growing. My basketball coach from high school is still my mentor to this day. And he was literally what saved me from myself. I swear from like not being a total crazy, like running something behind bars, who knows preacher's kid, because I was just a hellion growing up and I challenged everything. And then some still to this day, do I challenge everything? And then some, yeah. So I've carried that with me throughout life. But he taught me how to challenge things in a way that was, there was an impact to be made as to why I was challenged things. You know, you don't just challenge things just because you want to go against the odds of what everyone's saying. It's like, there has to be a rhyme and a reason and an impact to eventually be made in order to challenge. So challenger of the status quo through and through, I truly believe I'm resilient as they come. And I love to look at things that are adversities as hurdles that I have to figure out how in the world am I going to jump over this? And then you conquer it. And then it's one stair to time. Love that intro. I mean, <laughs> resonating a lot with what you're saying right there. I think, yeah, it's not only about challenging, but it is about coming up with a better way. Right. And that teaches you a lot about challenging. Cause it's like, if you want to challenge something or the status quo or whatever, at the same time, in order to do it right, you need to challenge yourself, you know, to come up with a better solution. Right. So now Talking a little bit more about, because that I'm sure will be reflected throughout the interview and, and this conversation when we talk about your professional experience, but starting, I'm sure, I know they had previous experiences before this, but like one of the first ones that is the most notorious, so to speak, or worth talking about, if you, if I may say, it's your experience at Seamless as a, an enterprise sales, right? So I want to know, first off, how you got there, because these days, most importantly, like tech sales is kind of hot, so to speak, everyone wants to get in and whatnot, and it's a great opportunity and you feel like you're building the future and, and all that. So I wonder how you got there. And also there, 
in your time there, what was your experience and what did you learn? Okay, so I told you before this, I was feeling a little bit spicy today, a little bit like hey, I'm going to say what I feel, what I want. So we're going to dive in. One, I love Brandon Bordanza. I think he has good people through and through. I think he's good. I think he's successful because he has chips on his shoulders. And therefore, I think a lot of the most successful people in the world, they've got chips on their shoulders and they've got something to prove and they've got something to say. So they, you see, you know, that's one of those things you look at someone and you can say, oh, well, you've got this and you've got that. And, you know, this is why you're successful and you're driving Ferraris. Cool. Like, I don't have that. And it's like, how can I get to your level? Like, what did you do? It's like, also, he's in the gym at 5 a.m. every morning and he's not drinking alcohol. He's doing all these things. It's like dedication, people, is how he got to where he's at. People love to hate. And look at me. I'm talking about him right now because people love that people talk about Grant Cardone the same. It's like people love to hate on those that they're like, would love to have that, but I'm not going to, you know, I would love to have eight books, nine books, whatever published. Didn't take the time to do it because I was doing X, Y, Z with my time. But, you know, I jumped into Seamless after being in a company inside out where there was no growth opportunity really left there. And it was during COVID. I was working from home. I sucked from working at home then totally made excuses for everything. <laughs> and I was like, this is awful. So I was like, I got to learn how to do this and do it well. And so I was like super hyper dedicated to saying, I need to go find a place that's going to push me to actually know how to do sales. So I know that I never was taught any kind of process. And I learned this in my last role, which is kind of wild. So years later, I'm looking at years prior saying, whoa, I never learned what an actual sales process was or how to do things, not just EQ led from me knowing how to talk to people. And so I jumped into interviewing the seamless and I was very confident with what I could bring to the table just based off results from the role, you know, one of the first like SDR gigs I had. I jumped into, and they were, seamless is big on hiring with them. So I'm looking at everything. I jump in, get hired, all that. But I sent Brandon a uh, Loom or whatever video, email, the, I think it was the day before my last interview. And I was like, can't wait to join you guys. Like overly confident. So I was like, my last interview is tomorrow. I just want to let you know. But I, I have no doubt that I'm going to be seeing you in like a company meeting soon. So he was like, hey, I love this. So you would just call me A. I don't know. Just, you know, nickname based. It's cool. So I was like, I'm in. So then I get there and I'm... One of the first calls that the company has is there were a bunch of reps that were hired because a lot of what I realized there was that growth was hiring a, you know, getting a bunch of bodies in and then seeing what happens. And I think that has been something that's shifted and changed talking to leadership there and still staying close with them because I've never left an organization without staying close to them because I think that's super powerful keep regardless enemies whatever keep them close like friends like keep people close no matter what they are arm's length right but close enough so i decided i was like okay i'm gonna go and do better than everyone here so at the first day on the phones i i said in the whole like company slack thing and i was like hey who's the top person to ever make or like book the most meetings within the company are they still here and who do i have to be so the guy was still there. He was an AE. And so I was like, all right, Ryan, you're it. Like, watch this. Booked more than him the first day because I was like, you know, wrote it on a sticky note because it's all that like visualization. And it was like, okay, I made a name for myself. Cool. Now let me go improve what I can do that's going to be not just like pipeline that I can, I didn't want to look at my numbers like everyone else did. And I looked around and I was like, okay, this is very bro -y. One, two, this is very much so everyone's looking at how many meetings you booked, not the revenue that's actually been, gen not just like the, the close one revenue created, like that is literally money that has been made for the company and put in your pocket. That was not necessarily the focus. It was like, how many meetings did you book? How many dials did you make? Are you working on Christmas Eve? Are you doing this? And it was like, no, because guess what? I'm going to build out my own methodology here into this madness. And so I decided that I was going to do 
pretty much the bare minimum of what I need to do with like the dials and all that. Because I knew if I led with EQ, it was like I could speak to people. If it didn't work, I'd say, hey, pretend I was on your team. And what would, what feedback would you give me? People love to hear themselves talk. They love it. These like VPs of sales, let them talk about like what they want and like ask them like you're a poor pitiful child, like help me. And they will literally be like, I got you. This is what I tell you to do. Even if they've never been in sales, right? <laughs> so I would say that. And then I'm like, all right, my turn, two minutes. Let me just see if I can do what you said. Nine out of 10 times they book. But I would only do this with like key people. Like I would only do this with like the top like companies that I targeted a list for. So I created my own target list, looked at the opportunities that were either close lost or people that I knew in my network. And then I worked with two AEs solely that I trusted and I knew that we could work like, because everything was kind of round robin. So I was, you know, cheating the system a little bit, if you will. They know this, they don't care because there was revenue generated, but I would, it would be like, hey, do you know this person at this company? They would ask me that. And I'm like, no, but they're in this community that I'm in. Let me go see if I can have this touch point there. So it was doing things where I was like, let me prove out and document what I was doing to say, hey, my role is not an SDR. My role is not an AE because SDRs are putting hair salons on calendars. I'm making no money if I do that. And I'm not a dude. So I can't climb this dude ladder. That's just what it is. So I was, you know, fast forward six, seven months, made myself I'll just say it made myself stay about five extra months because I was learning everything about what SDR world should not be made of. That you don't hire an SDR manager based off booked meetings. Like you can't do it just based off forecast of revenue. It was a learning, learning period in time that I am really grateful for because the data space is one that I think everyone should really hone in and focus on. Like intent, like all these things, like if you don't understand data, I think you're com like that's like the root of everything, right? It's like, you got to know. So learning a lot, I would jump in marketing meetings. They'd be like, hey, Amelia, like became good buddies with the Salesforce admin. Cause I'm like, no one's updating things. I'll send you wine if you update this. And he's like, all right, fine. So with all that said, I learned a lot about how to learn things and then unlearn things at the same time on how not to do things and then how to build my own methodology to madness that I saw. This podcast is brought to you by Founder Video. We'll cut your LinkedIn ads costs by at least 50% with natural looking creatives that prospects actually want to consume. Just have an expert in your C-suite show up to a 90 minute interview once a month and let us take care of the rest. Turn LinkedIn ads from an accepted line item expense into a scalable revenue channel that fits into your go-to-market strategy. Book a free consultation at foundervideo.io. One could say from what you said right there that you were not pioneering, I guess, but you were doing ABM, so to speak, right? And key account management in a way, right? But was that what led you to find to found the revenue table? Like, because I, well, first off, you touched on a, th a lot of things, right? Like the shift from booking meetings to focusing on revenue, bottom line, close one, all that stuff. And then the culture, like disruptiveness of coming into a company and doing things your own way in order to be a high achiever and just put yourself in a different bucket, right? I love that story because I think, especially for a lot of women, right, that want to get into tech sales and that are already in tech, that they, they, they and, and I don't, it's, I don't think it's a thing of men and women, but I think it's a thing of who, like, are you actually willing to pay the price of being yourself in order to do things your own way? so long as the outcome is better than most people, right? I think that's a great lesson right there. And the fact that you put it in practice in such a company just says a lot. Yeah, go ahead. You know, it's totally the chance that you have to take on yourself. It's the bet that you make on yourself of being like, I don't care what, other, if I believe in something enough and I can see the fruition from what I'm doing and I can show and prove the fruition of what I've created from what I've done, if you can prove it, I mean, revenue is revenue, right? Like revenue yesterday and revenue tomorrow and today, it's all the same. So prove what you can do, but documentation on everything is so vital to proving and pioneering anything that you're trying to do within a company. If you guys, you know, for women in sales too, it's like, 
I did a post on Women, you know, International Day, all that. And I said, happy day to everyone, which some people didn't love. But I also was like, you know what? Let's not make this solely about just one day that's like, let's celebrate in vain, but really we're just tolerating a day. Like that's the premise of what it was. It was like, no, there's also allies out there who are like, go women, go do your thing. You got this. And then there's also men who are struggling with the same kind of thing because they've got these, you know, older executives who are like, we're stuck in our ways. We have always done things this way. And they're like, no, we are the younger generation who sees things. We were born with the phone in hand. We know how to do things you don't. So, you know, challenging that, celebrate this, celebrate those that challenge the system because like right now that's what needs to happen. So with the revenue table, I split ways with Reggie, the company I was with, and I went in for sales. So here's, you know, a little background here. I went in for sales solely a weekend after them wanting to, me to learn a 16 page script. I said, respectfully, no, I will not learn a 16 page script in order to sell because my inbox is full of people I've either sold to previously, people within my network who have a lot of influence or those that surely just know me through some community or whatever. And they're like, Hey, who is Reggie? What is a Reggie? Da da da. And I'm like, well, it's not a human. It's a AI tool for salespeople. And so I showed this example to the two founders. And I'm like, Hey, look, people are asking what the hell this is. They don't know. They think it's a human. So I need to go be where the people are and let me go educate only to the extent with like EQ led, because that's where my strength is of being surrounded at the table. And this is where the whole concept kind of came from, like the revenue table, but being surrounded by the people who pass revenue and that's done through like community growth. That's done through different networking events. Like that's done through evangelism as a whole, which I don't believe that should be a title. I think everyone in a company should evangelize, spread the good word of what you solve for. I think there's also external evangelists that you have to empower to be able to be on this pedestal, if you will, whether it's your advisory board that needs to be activated or it's, you know, your, your users that are like, they love this. They're talking about it already. Awesome. Let's like make them famous too. Let's make people famous who are talking about your product. So I looked at all the things. And so when I parted ways with Reggie, I was like, there's got to be a, some way where there's revenue driven through relationships. And this is the whole nearbound approach, right? It's like kind of, you know, but it, that's more so surrounding your buyer and making it very buyer centric of saying, let's empower the buyer to be these evangelists. And then there's the nearbound, you know, it's the whole era, you know, let's talk T-Swift. It's the era of like all these things of like, how do you sell better today? And in my mind, everything is like, no, it's about the people first. It's literally people want to just be talked to like a human being. They don't want to be taught. Some people, it's EQ led, right? So it's like, you can look at some people and like, there's so many tools out there too, to where you can see like, oh, this person's very direct and stern. Don't, like, do not say more than three bullet points. Okay. Got it. Noted. So look at things like that. Or there's people who are like, let's have like the most fun conversation ever. And we can slack huddle our whole entire deal that we're going to create. But I looked at things. I'm like, all right, there's people within communities that I'm a part of. There's the PE or VC founders that I know well. They've got a plethora of all these, you know, four codes within. Why am I not sitting? Why I need to go sit at the table or create the table where I sit here and I surround myself with the right people where revenue is generated and passed whether it's through partnerships, whether it's, you know, the ecosystem that you build around you. And that's the whole premise behind it is revenue, their relationships. And I was sick of people selling the way they were Calls are not working, y'all. Get rid of your AI emails. I'm so sick and tired of it. Do not email me one more thing. I swear I might throw my laptop. Like I'm going to lose it. I told you I was feeling a little spicy today, but I, it's not working the way it used to work. And Buyers aren't buying from you the way they used to buy. So make it easy for your buyer to want to work with you. It's so massive right now. Yeah, and just, man, it's just such an intangible to know how to read people. Like what you said right there is such a good point. Like, you know, some people might need three bullet points. Some people might need a entire Slack huddle of 
two hours to get away from their family because they're like, you know what I mean? Like there's so, so much that goes into it. And I know, I love how you started the conversation to like, uh, I, don't, I don't think it was uh, recorded, but you were saying that um, you're someone that focuses a lot on the depth of people, right? Because a lot of people tend to see everything just on a surface level. And I think that in B2B is even, happens even more because we tend to think that uh, B2B for some reason, it's all rational. It's all about the numbers. It's all about, you know, how much sense does it make for the company? No, who's making the decision? And then, After you know who's making the decision, what the decision make you curse about? If you find that little spot that they care the most about, I'll tell you, they don't think about the numbers. They don't think about anything else. That little point that they're suffering, that is the itch, right? That is moving them and that moves them from one state to another, right? And when you tap into that at scale, pfft. That's how you that's how you scale companies these days, right? So And at scale, that's a tricky one there. So like pointer real quick for everyone here's an ad scale because a lot of things are like oh you don't personalize at scale cool be relevant at scale so how about we switch the personalization scale whole thing to being relevant at scale so go to the communities where your buyers are living someone puts something out there hey i'm looking put your keywords in there right in your slack whatever group that you're in keywords saying that you do i don't know you whatever you do Put the things that you saw for in there. Somebody, you'll get a ding, ding, whatever. Then you go and it'll show you, you'll be the expert then by showing up first when someone asks, but go check your CRM, do the due diligence. Then if it's someone, so like CEO, global CEO of Babel, big language learning company, she asked something one time in Pavilion. I jump in real quick because I was like, hey, I think I can help you out here. I'll shoot you a DM. So this is the relevant at scale and at point thing to do. So more eyes, so there were 4,000 something people within this one channel where she posted this, looking for help where content should live between sales and marketing when our SDRs roll up to our marketing side, but we need collateral built through AI. Cool, let me help, let me see if I can help you. So more eyes, 4,000 something eyes could see that. And then I'm also DMing her. So that's one to one, one to many. So that's relevant for the people that it's, at scale. So that's side note. That's something that I've learned is to be like highly effective and efficient and saves you a shit ton of time if you actually do it without pitching in any way. Super agreed. One of my mentors once told me that you need to exert, I mean, he said in bad words, exert shit out into the world. And I translate that to exerting infinite energy at a global scale, which is what we can do these days through social media. And, you know, with communities is you not only exert infinite energy at scale, but also you exert it like it, it's relevant energy. It's something that you know will hit because you're in the right place, right? So it's just so, so straightforward. And, and yet, I mean, you could have, it's it, this is not a thing that only one person can do. You could train a team on doing this, right? There's so many communities out there too. So yeah, either way, moving on a little bit is kind of, go ahead. So, sorry. Yeah. Come to me if you need help people, because I got you on that one. I've got like a million things created, I'm trying to figure out what in the world to do with them. So let's, we can work on that for your team. So I'll throw that one out there. Regarding evangelism, you mentioned it before and whatnot. We, like at this point, you already mentioned what it is and, and all that and how it's done. But why do you think it has become so popular? And how do you see it's being done wrong? Like, how are companies approaching evangelism? In the They're not making everyone evangelist. They're literally dubbing that as a title for an individual when your CEO, your CRO, your CFO, whoever, everyone needs to be your like the last hired SDR that you just had, they need to become an evangelist. So everyone should be spreading the good word of what your company solves for. I mean, Chili Pipers are a really good example of this. Like they do well with being omnipresent in places. Like they do really great with like, oh, you're on Instagram, you're on Twitter, you're on, you know, you're seeing them in all over, but you're also seeing people being celebrated too. So you're seeing like them celebrate like they're engineers. Cool. Awesome. But also here are like 
And here is, they let me do like a takeover or whatever. Cause I, I did some posts and I was like, Hey, what's up with people taking over LinkedIn pages? I don't get it, but I want to do it. So they reached, I had no idea what I was posting about, but they were like, okay, you can do it. So I jump in and they were like, give us hot takes on things that you want. I'm like, okay, let's play. And so I gave them a few hot takes and it was fun. It was like, cool. Cause I'm a user. It's like, they wanted to also uplift those that are users and show them on their company page. So that's the whole misconception behind what an evangelist even does. And it's also that's externally, right? Internally, make your people know how to actually share the good words, spread the good word of what your company does, and then build this army behind them with the customers that they sell to and keep giving. Like you give. Giving is part of evangelism through and through. So you can't just stop. That's where I feel as though sales needs to meet CS in some way because it's like, oh, there's the sales and marketing clash. Like, no, no, we don't even talk about sales and CS. Why aren't they talking? Because there could be all these like CS has got it from here. Like, but do you know who's taking it? Like, they're going to be talking to that person you sold to when they have problems arise. Like, how are you handling it? So, I've told companies, you know, sales teams, I'm like, no, put something on your calendar for two, three months out where you just have a simple check-in with your buyers, I'm like simple check-in. If they're, if it's month to month, whatever, do it two weeks out and just say, Hey, checking in saying, Hey, hope all is going well, no agenda of any sort, but that's where referrals come from. That's where recommendations come from. That's where the like reduced churn is going to happen when you just show up for people. So like evangelism falls under that. It's like, who is teaching evangelism? No one. Like that's not really being taught. It's just being tossed as a title. Love that. Love that. I was about to ask you, what are the five baby steps that a company can take in order to start doing evangelism the right way? And I think, well, I'll let you answer that first. <laughs> I mean, one, it's got to start with your customers. So I think those are going to be the people like everybody wants to have revenue. Cool. So stick with the rest. Like you don't want to lose it. So stick with the people already like who have gained revenue for your company, go to your customers and get them on a panel or something, get them to talk about things like ask them if they will do this. Also set up a, like that could be one, two referral program. So set up through your marketing side, like, is there some kind of portal where there's or anything where people can go where they have a code and they get 10, 15, 20% off when someone, you know, or someone gets, you know, or they get that referral kickback, whatever it is of that percentage based off that sale because they referred someone to that company. So that's being done externally. They could be customers or not. They could be just like one licensed users if it's a product or it could be, you know, with Activio. So I'm, help kind of with their evangelist efforts through different communities and their strategy approach. And so I was talking to them recently. I was like, Hey, why not do a live demo for like 20 minutes? Because then that's going to speed up a lot for people to be like, what are you doing? Like, who are you? Then just share that, break it into pieces, then have that to where it can be shared in different, where it needs to go. This part's relevant to this individual. Cool. Then like even have from like those feedback pieces from people who are not your buyers. I think that's kind of three of having that feedback, those feedback loops created to where you're understanding what buyers are talking about. And then you're able to relay that. Then you're actually, then it's like, Hey, go to your marketing side say, we need this collateral bill or go do it yourself. Figure out how, if I can do something, you can do something. I promise anyone and everyone that, I was telling you, well, before this, y'all, I can't plug two things in. So, like, if I can figure out how to create collateral <laughs> on certain things that are relevant to specific individuals, I assure you, you can too. So, go do that. Then send it back to them. Hey, based off the feedback that you gave me, is this something that makes more sense? And then these people are going to probably give you a little bit of praise for doing that work. Set time blockers up to do that little bit of work. And then show them if this is like a big account, right? This is like an expansion or an upsell, you know, or if it's net new and it's huge. Awesome. Do not waste your time on little things that are not going to be, you know, filling your pockets or 
helpful for them when they should be using a different tool. Like, don't be a shitty seller. But sales, I mean, evangelism too, for the fourth point, I would say, figure out if it should live under sales or marketing. So if you do have a title for that within someone who's owning the whole evangelist effort, which can be the, like I said, advisor activation strategy, like your top 10 advisors who speak to your ICP, how are you going to activate them to be able to be on podcasts with your CEO, you know, or if it's, you know, certain your power users, how are we really going to activate this like strong, like referral program with them? These things, who's going to own the evangelist motion and whoever that is, do they carry a bag too? Do they have a quota? Do they send under marketing? And is it going to be a quarterly bonus because you brought in X amount of opportunities or is it close one revenue that you're looking at? So those are things to look at. And then the fifth part I would say is like, maybe don't hire an ex like internal evangelist. Like maybe you let that sit with someone who's in, like maybe that should be a, like a director level and above role that is owning the community growth. Because the, think about where your buyers are at. It's like community growth. It's the social strategy. It's the, it's customer too. So it's customer led as well. So it's sitting, it's too many hands and too many buckets if you just want to call it evangelism as a, as a whole. So figure out where it should live under sales or marketing. If it should be under sales, great. Make them like the director of engaged, you know, whatever, engagement strategy, whatever it is. Or it's like the strategic go-to-market function. Whatever that function is, make it something to where it's not going to be like Big X because you've got enterprise sales and that freaks me out and buyers will not come to you. Like you're going to be chasing people like a psycho, like a raccoon with rabies in the day. So like, do not put an evangelist in a sales role in my opinion, but let them carry a bag. Yeah. Love that. And I think a way to, you mentioned uh close one revenue pipeline opportunities. Well, not as good metrics to measure evangelists on, but I think, one good metric as well that you could measure it on if there's like a really baby step that every company could do is take someone not from sales but probably from cs and get them to increase sales velocity on active deals through evangelism right through community community-led growth slack communities too i want to ask you uh, as well about the the role of slack in near bond revenue growth because i saw that you did i think an event or a live like something on LinkedIn about it. So, and I haven't checked it out. That's my bad. I haven't done my like proper due diligence, but just, I need to, it's on my list. <laughs> but I would love to know, like, what are your thoughts on that? Because I think, of course, there are, there are communities on Slack, right? It's kind of tricky. And most people would think like, how can I leverage Slack when Slack is kind of private and I don't have full access to all of the information that I would love to have access to in a lot of way, in a lot of cases, right? So, how do you see Slack being leveraged properly for revenue growth, especially with the evangelist approach? Through sales marketing, and I've said it before, like sales marketing, evangelists, you know, all the above career, that is Slack has been my number one revenue generating channel of any other channel. And that is not the norm. And people always give me a look of like, huh, why, how, what, <laughs> tell me more. And so I did this one post. I'm in the carpool line dropping my kids off. And some girl reached out and she's like, hey, how do you set up keywords in Slack? Because I had mentioned at some point, like, hey, do this and to her or whatever. And so she sends me a quick note. It's like 7 a.m. dropping my kids off. I'm like, you know, have whatever Taylor's still probably playing because my kids are like singing at the top of their lungs. And so I'm responding to her. But I was like, wait a second. People don't know what they don't know. And so I just started doing a post real quick, like sitting there and I was like, here's six things you can leverage to generate revenue through Slack. This thing got like, I don't know, over hundred K impressions. And I'm like, wait a second, there's clearly a need for something to be said. Like there's something to be said for that. Like there's a need for go to market teams to understand how to go to market through Slack. And Slack is owned by Salesforce, right? So like where are the Salesforce people teaching how to leverage Slack? I don't see them. I'm happy to chat with you, Salesforce and Slack. Side note, I'm, and you will, I'm going to send you all this recording. I can't wait. But I realized that one, it was so easy when you see that green dot right there, they're online. Same goes for LinkedIn. It shows active now. 
So if you go in these communities, so one, go, there's an air table, whole like guide, like it literally is a table. You can filter it down to like, say you're in HR and you want over 4,500 people within a group, you know, community, you want it to be you know, HR focus. You want it to be mostly director level and above. And then, or you want it, um, it to be a paid community or not. You want it only in North America. Cool. Filter that down. It'll give you the ones that are available. So there's, I want to say, gosh, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I can, we can share when we share the recording of this, but there's 32 million active like daily users on Slack. There's 64 million monthly active users and that alone, think of what you solve for. So say it's the data, right? Okay. Tell me you can't go find a buyer in some community. You can't go find a community if you go filter down like that, because who do you sell to probably? You're going to see, you're going to probably see, but you're depending on price point, right? It's like, okay, the inside under the rug under that 15K, cool. Like marketing doesn't have, if it's marketing side, like they could probably like you befriend them. Cool. They don't have to really go get that procurement and all the legal stuff figured out. Great. That's the easy one to do. But the big point here is like, go find those communities. It might be Reddit threads, y'all. Like it might, like you're in manufacturing. Cool. Like that could be where they live. Probably not. They're probably having landlines still, but they're probably making a ton of money on some land somewhere and wherever. And they've got their, they've got their cell on them at all times. Like if you can find those cell phone numbers, that's where you should go. So knowing your ICP is where you start, knowing how to communicate with your ICP is the next part. Like if that's where they live, great. Then how do you talk to them as a human? So again, people want to be people like, and be talked to like, I'm, they're not their title. Granted, some people want to be praised. So like learn when to like, love what you guys are doing. Amazing. Like you have done amazing in your tenure there. Blah, 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 blah. Awesome. Play the game. It's all a game. It really is. But at the same time, when you're playing this game, don't BS the game, like in such a way to where trust is burnt, like build the bridge of trust between evangelizing and spreading the good word to where someone wants to hold your hand and walk over that bridge that you built into the sales side of your org. Cause buyers are not buying going straight to your sales org. like they don't want to be talking to your sales people. They're not sitting at that table. They're not like, can I pull up a chair and let's talk about your solution and you give me a 45 minute demo? Like, no, obviously not. They're like, I'm going to the table over here where my friends are at, who are also founders who are saying, what are you guys using? And this is where we sit, a AKA community or wherever they're at, like could be a Facebook group, whatever it is. Probably not in B2B SaaS. Like, I can almost guarantee there's going to be a sale. You know, it's like, like, come to me if you can't find one. I promise you, we will find you one if you can't, because this is something that, like, I am so passionate about. And I don't get passionate about technology. I don't. But I get passionate about helping people. So when I can see that I'm helping someone through learning what they didn't know before, because I become that expert in what I'm doing because I set up my keywords where so I know you go to your picture, click on it. And then halfway down, it says like preferences, click on that right there. It says keywords. You just type them in. So whatever's relevant to what you solve for, put that in, you'll be notified. Go find this just, but ask your buyers too, the ones that you develop relationships with like, Hey, where do you guys all hang out? Like be normal and be you. And by asking that, they're like, oh, we're in this WhatsApp group. Do you want to invite? That probably will happen. So I'm in way too many WhatsApp groups to where I've literally shut it all down. Like, I don't even know how to do it. It's like, it's reached like the 9,999 point to where I don't think it goes to the 10. Like, it's just, I can't look at it. It's too much happening. But I know there's specific groups in there. If I really want to go, I can go find the right person in there and communicate with them in this dark social aspect of this isn't a sales, you know, I'm not trying to sell you, but also you know me enough to know I've got something that you have a problem with. I, the solution is like in my hands. Cool. Let me guide you to the right people. And if it's not my solution, let me give you two referrals of people that I believe could help you. 
that all comes back around and then some. So even when you see in a community, someone saying, looking for that, whatever it is, you don't solve for that. That's not your realm. Do not act like it is. Do not say you do. That's BSing a sale and nobody will want to be your friend ever. So then you will not be hireable. But then it's a like, hey, this isn't here to, this isn't totally my realm, but here's two people who I know have executed on this. Like, amazing. like they have top tools or top people. Tag them. Like you'll get a note saying thank you if you know them or not. But trust the people that you tag because those are referrals. Again, those are recommendations that come back around. That's revenue that comes back around in some way, shape, form. So much stuff. I mean, if I was new to this stuff, I would be pausing the podcast over and over. <laughs> like you, you dropped so much stuff there. It's so like great. The Airtable directory that you mentioned, if you can link me to it, I'll link it below the podcast because I think it's just such a resource, right? That people can use. Yeah, and for sure. also, because the post had a ton of. Yeah, no, for sure. Got you. Yeah, yeah. No, super great. Love that. And the keywords for Slack, I've done that before such a hack like it's just you go straight to the point and I'm, i love the table metaphor that you're doing like you know we sit at this table and you guys sit at this other i was thinking like b2b if only trade shows were parties without batch scans and phones people would fucking know how to socialize and be human right like it's just not that hard <laughs> It would be so fine if it was like a wedding, you know, kind of thing. And it's like, okay, you have to sit at this table and like, you've got your little name badge, but they mix it all up. It's like a CFO with an SDR and then the, the social person. And then it's like the head of evangelism, you know, whatever. And it's like, mix it up and mingle and figure out what other, like cross trade, like learn. And it's like all different organizations too. It's like, or your competitors and just like converse, be human and talk. And see what happens. Like, I now you just that's a business idea, honestly. I don't know if anyone is doing it, but organizing like cool events for B2B, mixing up people and whatnot sounds so great to me. Like, honestly, because I'm so, I, I like one of my things is like, I love everything that's that involves people and socializing. I love it. And when you make that an experience for people like to impact someone's day to day, it's just yeah, beautiful. So that for B2B mixing up partners and stuff like pff, that's I love what yeah. you just said that Great word things. There's two words that you said, like one of the first words that you said was disrupt. And like, that is one of my favorite words, like disruption, because I think there's such a positive way to disrupt. And I think that goes into this. And then also it's the impact. Like that's another word that's like, you know, there's a few words that just stick, right? It's like the impact. There has to be impact made or it's just lost time or it's just, you know, done in vain because you want to think like it's funny just to do, right? It's an MTV show. Like this could go to Netflix. We don't know. And then you just said something else. What was the word? Shoot. I, I just lost it. But what did you say? I forget. You just said something else, but what, it'll come to me in two minutes. I promise. So what, socializing what people relationships i don't know <laughs> in fact <laughs> we'll come back to me because i was like yes but it is all about like yo no experience and it would come back for the experience so that goes into like even the buyers today like it's not a buyer's journey like it's a buyer's ex they don't remember they might not remember the company you're at they remember you so if you're not memorable then you're out of sight, out of mind, and they're going on to the next. So like make it a point to be memorable by showing up as yourself because nobody's doing that. There's a handful. Cool. But like be yourself. Yeah. Okay. What do you think? I mean, I guess I, we'll see, but I, I want to know your take. Video in general. Video is all the rage right now for everything, both for an advertising, prospecting, social content, podcast, repurposing, it's everywhere, right? People want to do video everywhere for everything. What are some of the most creative, low friction ways that you've seen of B2B companies leveraging video? Do you want a story? Can I share real quick? Okay. So this is a, it, some people probably have heard me talk about this. Some people have not. So I wanted to talk to Mark Cosiglo real bad one time. He was at outreach and I was like, I'm going to talk to him and he won't respond to anything I'm saying. 
in no way, shape, form. I'm like going all out trying to talk to this man. And so I'm like, all right, maybe I use video. I mean, I send him like a video, like everything. I don't know the rules of video at the, at the time of the seamless is years ago. I didn't know anything. It's like a three minute long video. So I talked to someone and they're like, who would ever watch that to begin with? I was like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. So <laughs> one, I realized that was a bad idea. And then I saw someone comment on something that he posted and they were like, oh, well, if you want to talk to him, you better get Flava Flav involved. And I'm like, okay, cameo real quick. And I'm like, 6K, no way. So then I look next to him and it's William Hung, like she bang, whatever, dude, from like, I don't know, American Idol or whatever years ago, 25 bucks. And I was like, all right, let's do it. So he sends, I tell, I like do the thing, tell him what to say. And he records this in his bedroom, clothes all over the back of it, like his, like on his bed. And it's hilarious. His closet door's open. He's like, hey, Mark, Amelia over at Seamless wants you to meet with her. And Flava Flav says to do it too. Yeah, boy, whatever he does. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is hilarious. And I was like, this is so awful. It's like, this has to be sent. Like, if I don't do something with this, like, I've ruined everything in my life. Like, this has to be sent. Ship it off to Mark. And I'm like, okay, this, he says, no, he says Flava Flav. He doesn't even say Flava Flav, making it even better. So I'm like, okay, we're doing it. We're shipping it. I send it. So this is the other way to kind of do video is like leveraging, not just yourself, like leverage, like cameos, like leverage, like powerful voices. Try it. But within three or four minutes, I get a message back from Mark and he's like, my kids and I won't, cannot stop laughing and watching this video. Here's the cell phone number of the dude that you need to reach. Tell him I gave it to you. He's like this bright my day. And I was like, awesome. So now I'm friends with Mark because of that simple video. So make that said, I shipped that with it being where he said Flava Flav, not Flava Flav. His room was a mess. I was like, this is going to be a, like a swinger and mess. I don't know what's about to happen. But it was a home run. It worked. Was it a home run? Eh, in the sense that I got to, I need to. But the relationships have been fruitful in their own ways of knowing the right people. So I think that goes into video today. One, keep it less than 40 seconds. Two, and that goes for voice notes. Two, make sure that what you are doing is relevant to them, that it is not going to be an in mail. Maybe that's point number three. Do not send it in mail, y'all. I'm so, I've said it twice now. This is like the, like that might have been three times. Like, stop it. No in mails. Four times I said it. Now, then the third point would be with video, it's like make it engaging. Like, how fun with it. Like use your hands, like be like yourself. And maybe that's not you. Cool. Don't be something you're not because people can sense that through and through. Like, you know, the awkward people and they're like, Hey, so I'm just trying to, and you're like, Oh God, stop now. That is not you. Stop it. So when you like cut it now, like you just, you watch and you see, you're like, dang, they only watch 42%. Like if you see that you're getting where people watch like 70% or below new strategy, approach people, new strategy. So go and see the time. So like, you know, Vineyard, SendSpark, which is a great tool for doing it at scale. Definitely go play around with SendSpark. I've become close friends with Bethany, the founder, who she's like disruptor through and through, the word I love. And she is entrepreneur and she just found a SendSpark sticker on a UPS random truck somewhere, which is amazing. So like... They're evangelizing. People are evangelizing for them. It's awesome. So make sure your videos are engaging enough for people to want to watch. But if it's only personalized, like, hey, we went to the same school together and we have the same dog. Like, that's weird. Don't do that. But make sure it's like, hey, I saw that this, like, if there might not be a CTA. It might just be, I'm sharing for you guys, like, also saw this and this made me laugh. Like do something where it's going to be engaging. I saw this made me laugh that someone posted from your team. Clearly you've got a fun team to be a part of. Like you're raising them right or something fun. Then thought it would, you know, thought about you when I saw this, that kind of thing too. Or your CTA at the end doesn't have to be a CTA. It can be a, 
would love your feedback. Feedback is a golden word. Would love your feedback on a few things that we're doing over here based on you being in the role that you're in. And either way, make it nonchalant. Either way, great to say hello to you and add someone new to my network, you know, or be able to connect with someone new. I'll toss my account for the sake of simplicity, if you feel bold enough, if you so choose, people, for the sake of simplicity, I'll toss my calendar link after this if, if you want to toss time on that makes the most sense for you and your schedule. I love doing that because it does make people's lives easier. So, like, make it easy to be work. Like, people want to work with people who are easy to work with, who are just normal. So, be bold. Sam Jacobs, uh, CEO of Pavilion, was uh, saying this in a post today, like how important it is. Like he was mentioning how all of the great deals that he closed in his life, like the 25 million investment from Elephant Ventures for Pavilion, the, you know, deciding to, who to hire, who to, everything goes out, smooth, like happens smoothly. When there's a certain level of friction, you know that you're not going to get your money. You know that deal is not going to come through because there's so much points of friction that so many points of friction that it just makes it so unlikely right and that i think speaks to the increasing importance of just how easy it is to work with you and how smooth does it flow when i'm with you right like are you the kind of person that makes everything seem easier or are you the kind of person who makes off a single little task the entire world and if i need to get that task done with you i'm going to spend the entire afternoon because there's people like that right so and this, I love that th th this is the way we're going because I think that it puts in the spotlight the people who might not have been so like or, or have developed such an expertise in the technical stuff or the, the hard skills, so to speak, the technical knowledge, everything that's now getting quote, not replaced, but that, that, that is getting commoditized with AI and the people who actually have those soft skills, who actually have been always good with people and thought that EQ and that intangible was never to be leveraged in such a technical world. And now we're getting our, our piece of the cake. So I love that. Uh, but how do you think, let's talk about, I think a concept that we haven't talked about in this interview yet is the self-awareness, right? I think self-awareness plays a big role in B2B sales, especially in tech, SaaS, everything technical. I don't like to say that word that much, but how have you seen it throughout your career? Yeah, right? Because technical is like, okay, well, whatever. It's what we, it's what makes the world we live in these days, right? So how have you seen throughout your career the abundance or lack thereof self-awareness in B2B sales? Mm, that's a great question because I don't see it much. You see, there's a, okay, it's a handful of people I can think of right now, maybe three, that I'm like, they are so self-aware of what it is that they're doing that they will share these posts of like, hey, I screwed up with this. I should have done this. And it's like, whoa. Or if you talk to certain people who are in the sales mission, it's like, wow, you have a whole, like, you are so, I am not a super highly organized person. I have organized chaos and I know where the things are, where in my, not necessarily in my mind, I write a lot of to-do lists because I'll lose my first one. <laughs> so like for me, it's a, I know where things are, but I'm not to a T, like everything goes on this page, this day, this time, like here's all the things. I worked very hard to color code my calendar, but that means shit because it's just colors I wanted to do. That, that so, but there's people who are so great with documentation when it comes to what worked, what didn't work. So knowing who you are and who you're not, and it does equally, if not more important, not knowing who you are not is going to get you so much further than just simply knowing who you are. So if you do not have that self-awareness of saying, oh, I should have or could have done this, or I did this well, this is where... I am gathering that feedback too, like I'm hearing and having the right kind of coaches and mentors and leaders to pour into you and being able to actually ask questions and say, what could I have done? And you trust their feedback. Like if they give you vague feedback, like those aren't the leaders you want to be working for. And those are not your mentors. I assure you that. But being able to actually say, this is who I am, this is who I'm not. This is what I'm aware of that I'm doing well. Here's my, like, I'm 
thriving. Here's where I'm like merely surviving, like make two lists, like merely surviving, thriving. Cool. Write down the things that you're doing and then have it to where when you look back on these conversations that you're having with people and what people are saying back to you, like even screenshot some things and like celebrate your damn self. Like if you're doing really great with some things, like acknowledge that. And that's self-awareness too. Like, Hey, this is not like, I'm so great. It's like, this is what happens when you show up as like yourself and you're aware of who you're talking to, that people give you feedback like this, tag that individual, make them feel important too. And then if you're not, if you're not a content creator, right? Like if that's not your thing of like posting and doing all these things, then do it for yourself. Like just have it to where, you know, I like, if you're not aware, what the hell are y'all doing? Like, if you are not self-aware, you're going through motions, you're choosing complacency, you're choosing to be mediocre, and you're choosing to not take action, which is still an action in and of itself. So if you want to take action and be better, you got to start and go backwards. Go be self-aware of what it is that you do well. Do a SWOT analysis on yourself. Go ask people to, one, do a SWOT analysis. Two, ask people what they would say if you walked out of a room, you're the best at. It's a, it's pretty wild when you ask that question, what people say, because I did that for about a week. I asked, I don't know, maybe six, seven people that they all said something different. And I was like, okay, we got to figure out who I am when I grow up. Like, this is not okay. If everyone thinks I help everyone, that's helping no one. So being aware enough to say, I need to go ask people what it is too, that they feel as though I'm the best at, and then doing, you know, figuring out what your strengths are. If you don't know where your strong suit is, like, where is it that you're the strongest? Where is it that you feel as though you're lacking? Like, feel it, write it down, and then work on certain things at certain times. Like, have a massive focus on curiosity, right? Like, that's a big one. Of I'm going to be hyper aware that I'm going to ask the right questions. And I'm going to be curious, like, genuinely curious to understand how I can solve for them. Curiosity is such a driver and question asking uncovers a multitude of problems. And then you become a little bit of a therapist at times. Like, don't, you know, I've accidentally crossed that line a few times where it's like, well, let me help you with your life. You know, it's like, oh, wait, (laughs) stop back up. But I'm like, let me help my own self first. But no, I mean, that falls into the evangelist whole thing too, of like being aware of like spreading the good word. But why are you doing it with these individuals? You're aware of who it is. It's a self-awareness, but also like awareness and totality. Who it is that you're talking to, who it is that you are spreading the good word to. Also, who you are engaging with, that's the self-awareness. Like that one, what, how am I going to engage with this person where it's going to be beneficial for them and I'm going to feel better because of it, that I helped and truly helped and focused in on where I don't feel like I'm the strongest. And then played up on the, you know, my strong areas that I'm best at. So much stuff here to unpack. Curiosity, you know where I learned that it was the most important thing. I remember there's an essay from Paul Graham. It's pretty well known, How to Do Great Work, right? And he talks Mm -hmm. about insatiable curiosity, right? The main driver you should focus on if you want to build something great. Like, it's not about motivation. It's not about discipline. It's about that innate feeling of your child kid of who you are when you're born and when you are innocent and you're not that self-aware of what's around you that le- leads you to explore the unknown and find new paths and just you know find the intersection is something that hasn't been discovered so to speak or hasn't been explored and that's where you find like new like paths of knowledge and whatnot disciplines what? now another point that you made sorry No, I said totally. And so that's the exploratory phase of like, here, let me uncover certain things that maybe you didn't, like, what if this doesn't happen by next month? It's like, that's a great, like, that's one urgency too, curiosity of like, oh, I didn't think of it like in this inverse kind of way. What if we don't? Oh, I'm getting fired. Okay. Let me jump on this right away when you are in a selling motion. So thinking of it that way too, totally. And that's when thinking about the first action or the action item that's, you know, around the corner. But then when you 
let yourself be led by your curiosity to in order to think about the second and third order of consequence of every decision that you take and, and all of the extra points for not this quarter but the quarter after that and then the year and that that that's when it gets really great but i loved how and i just want to make this point like how self-awareness is the very starting point. Like if you're not self-aware, what are you all doing, right? I think it, it, it cause without self-awareness, like you need to be aware in order to accept or acknowledge or, or understand the your, your, what's around you and, and your reality as well. And once you understand, then you can improve. It's the only way. Because otherwise, yeah. like then, then you'll be applying tactics that you've been hearing, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I was telling my seven-year-old when we're walking through like the Target parking lot the other day. I'm like, "Yo, kid, self-awareness right now." I'm like, "Get out of the middle of the road. We are. Why are we skipping in the middle of the street when there's literally a car like tr like right behind you going slow because they see a kid there? Bad mom award right there. But I because I was looking at my other kid and I was like, "All right, why are we touching every car? Stop." So I'm like. All right, you two in front of me now, hold hands the whole way in. They're like, mommy, why? I'm like, because you're going to learn what it's like. You're going to look around you, be self-aware. I'm like, and then when we get to where we cross over to go into Target, you're going to count to three and look both ways. And you're going to tell me three things that you see as well when we walk inside. And they're like, well, why? I'm like, because it's what you're going to do. And I was like, because you're going to become self-aware little kids. And I promise you, if you're mine, you're going to be self-aware because you can't skip and not think you're not going to get hit when you're going down the middle of the street when there's cars coming. Like, don't do that. So that's basically what it is. It's like, oh, let me just like lollygag through life. And let me see if these deals like come to me without like, let me see if people swerve around me. No, that's not how it works. Like, you got to know what's happening around you in order to take action to not get fired, which is like being hit, right? It's like, you know, you're done if you're not self-aware. Like, I will call that shot all day. Like self-awareness keeps your job moving. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I just, there was this thing that you mentioned before. I, I wanted to pick it up too. You were saying a, a good way to do this is to just ask people like, why are you good at? What do you excel at? When you leave the room, what people talk about you, right? And I've been asking that question to my parents and everyone around me since I was like, I don't know, 10 or something. <laughs> like I was, you know, had that urge to know, like, what do you think I do great? Because I was, I've, I mean, I'll, of course, as a kid, like you're always lost, right? Like you need answers and you're always finding answers. But damn, like if only people would to do that in, in, in their jobs, like <laughs> things would be way easier, right? Like, and not only that, with customers as well, it's like, please tell me, like, why are, like, what do you value the most from our relationship? Like, why are you buying? Why do you keep paying every month? And what is like actually providing you value from our solution? And I've asked that to our customers and then you find out that some of the stuff that you thought it was such a great unique selling point that no other competitor had and nobody cared about that, right? Or yeah. just it's some syntax that you thought that in the pitch, oh, but this slide we need to keep because this is like a must, right? And then the guy said, I actually, most of the pitch thing was not enticing, right? Like I didn't care about that. I was already sold when you did this part or not, you know? So it's, yeah, really but, insightful. And of course, because like, you didn't it. do slides, they probably liked you more. Like, because you didn't do a slide presentation, you probably were liked more. And I've had people say who were buyers of mine before, well, we liked you and you solved what we needed. Like this made sense. And it was like, because you liked me as a human being, because I treated you like a human being. That speaks volumes when people just like you for you. And like, not everyone's going to like everyone. Like there's people who hate me. Sure. Hate me. I love that. But you got to like have that feel from the haters. Right. But it's the people who, those are the people who go and tell someone else, go talk to Amelia. She knows what she's doing with this, you know, like when it comes to you know, meeting your buyers where they live, right? Like the different communities or being engaging with C-suite. How do you talk to executives or their people? How do you do that as an SDR? How do you have conversations with people to where you let their guard down and let them know, like, here, I'm here to help you. I'm not here to sell you. Yes, everyone, we're in the SaaS B2B world. You're there to sell. No one's stupid in that sense. Like, we know what each role does. A lot of these roles, do I believe, will be eliminated? Yeah, I do. And do I think SaaS is going to go downhill? To an extent, yeah. But And that's my two cents. But I also firmly believe that the people who become the experts in what they do right now 
and it doesn't mean technical. It means like the soft skills too, expert in what you do and you make yourself that, you will still stay in that 20%, 30% that's gonna remain out of probably this whole 100% of what we see today because things are becoming acquired. The company, you're seeing these acquisitions happen left and right because they're like teaming up with the best. Cool, let's get the top people in the right place together then let's go recruit the right people to be a part of this. And then it's like, it's this top, they're just top of the funnel. That's what it is. So who are the top people? Okay, you want to be a part of that. Great. So level up on the soft skills because that's where buyers are buying with the people who have those. And they know how to pull in the technical side too. So I would pull in an SE of mine all the time. I'm like, help as so i would send a bunch of sos slack messages real quick i'm like no idea what this person's even saying help me <laughs> like like it was really annoying they thought i was saying so 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 but it was just sos over and over and they're like i didn't know you needed my help <laughs> i was like oh i should just do one sos but he would jump on because i would slack him I'm like hey, do you have two seconds like to just help me navigate and figure out what to say to this person and when he would hop on it was like technical buyer to technical individual on the team like that was trust that was being built not for me as a salesperson it was like hey there's expertise within i'm not bsing you let me grab somebody who knows so knowing when to grab the right people too who can do like work as a team with your people internally if they know what they're doing if they don't go find experts externally that you can go and pick their brains and be like what do I say when someone says this? Because I have no clue. And just learn. Like, learn to learn. Like, learn to love to learn. Like, you have, you've got to learn that loving the whole process of learning is a really cool thing. When you're like, I know, you look back and you're like, I didn't know this a year ago. I didn't know this six months ago. But I keep repeating the same phrase. And now it's like muscle memory. It's just like part of what my Rolodex that I've got. Because I say these things. You know, it's cool to see how things shift if you shift with the times and with the industry with the market and you grow and learn from the top players there and you just go and talk to people how much can shift and change in your world poof enlightening to me really great stuff i just to wrap it up i wanted to ask you what are some of the b2b company well first off you mentioned that you think that b2b SaaS is, is in a decline and what, what i i want you to do to go deeper in that. I do. I do think it is. I think buyers are so smart. I think technology is moving faster than people, which we all know that. But I think that there's, I think, I think it's on the up and up, but in the decline of role of jobs and the sense that if you're not, like I said, if you're not an expert, you will be eliminated. That's where I'm a firm. I really truly believe that because there will be replacements through AI. I don't care what people say. Like, and that could like, you know, really stir some, you know, madness. That's fine. Let it stir because my opinion doesn't have to be yours. But also I just see things for what they are. And being not someone's buyer, but still receiving these emails of, I think we can help you and your team do this. And I'm like, that says, with the little things, first name. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how many people did you send this out to? You know, how many, or it's like, this is automated as can be. And it's clear because then, I mean, the, the new thing that I keep seeing is like the third touch is just your name question mark. So it's like Amelia question mark. Like, yeah, I'm still here, but like I left you on red on purpose. <laughs> like, I read, like I left that message on red because I don't, I'm not going to respond to this. Like, or if I put it, cause that's the way I can kind of compartmentalize a bit with my messages. It's like, mark something is unread. Then I know to get back. But there's some that's like, whoa, those are your touches. It's like, that's not, or it's like, I can see this is not a priority for you right now. I'm like, but this has nothing to do with the role that I'm even in. This has nothing to do with what my focus is. If you were to just read my about section, you'd see that I am not sales enablement. So like, what are we talking about here? And why are you asking for my CEO when I'm not working for one right now? Like, like that's the whole, you know, it's interesting to see. So I'm like, those roles right there, that's AI already taking your place. And it shouldn't be. So who's coming in and teaching salespeople how to sell like humans again, leveraging AI, being the co-pilot while you are in the driver's seat. 
and then putting that EQ in the passenger seat with you and then also putting the IQ in the back seat too. You know, it's like, you've got to play with like, you can't, you got to shift people around. Like it can't be AI driving you in the passenger seat, EQ, IQ, let's just let them like do whatever they want in the back seat. It's like, no, you and like the IQ need to sit up front. It's like, let the back seat driver be the AI and then let the IQ follow with what's going on too. You know, like that comes in and says like, no, we got to take a left turn here. Cool. Like let that also be where they have a voice, but you, and I think of it like it literally is a car, like people sitting, I'm like, you got to drive and this is how things should be. And that's how buyers are buying. That's how people are interacting. That's how people will know who you are and you're memorable because your human approach is something that is distinct and it's different from others. It's not going to be the same all. So yeah, I do believe that there's going to be probably 30% that's going to be like the hierarchy of all of what is like, I think consolidation station is totally happening. As we look at things today, there's going to be all these consolidated like tools and it's going to be the best of the best people who are experts in what they do. And if you do not become an expert, in whatever you're field is, I don't care if you're an SDR, like go and be an expert SDR, be an expert at inbound, driving inbound and driving demand through an outbound approach. So go to these communities, go where your buyers live and create the demand, even as an SDR. It does not matter what role you play, but you know how to create demand through an in, through this outbound approach, but you're driving inbound leads that are qualified. So not everyone knows how to do that. That's an expert in what you do. Simplified. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean you have to be like 12 years experience. No, you've been in it a year. Cool. Focus in on that one thing. As you say, create demand by being uniquely you. <laughs> Amen. You were mentioning who's going to teach salespeople how to be human and whatnot. We need a Sandler 4.0 on steroids, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be tough. It's, yeah, I just think, I think events could be like, it's one of the things that would fix a lot of that. Like, but events, not like inbound or conferences that a lot of people go to already. Like, I mean, something that's not as professional or stiff or call it whatever you want, but without batch cans, without the booths, without the, all these stuff, right? Like, <laughs> just Sandler. have a good time, man. <laughs> together people will communicate like literally you throw a bunch of people in a room to see what happens like throw the right people in a room at one point i wanted to do i think it was with gtm find or it was with someone and i was like what if we did a charity gala and i was like one people want to go dress up let's go get like some i don't know boat or something i don't know who's paying don't know we'll talk about it later but then Let's do it for some good cause. People love a good cause. Let's do this with the right people and just get them in a room. And everybody wants to like get all dolled up, have fun, whatever, and just see what happens. Like do it for a good cause. And then it's like communication and conversations and relationships evolve from there when you've got a reason to be there too. And keep it decentralized. That's one of the most important things too, I think. Like, cause why social works? Why communities work? because they're decentralized, basically. They, like an internet and buyers have decided to buy differently and to not talk to sales and then to not go to your blog and whatnot because social is in the rise, because why? Because social is decentralized. There's not someone here telling you go in this bucket, you go in this other bucket. If you search for this thing, you're gonna have these results. No, it's go find your way. Go find who you like resonate with, Go find who you know want to be with, and then you build your network. I love LinkedIn because of that. LinkedIn makes you so, makes it so seamless for you to actually like once you start connecting with the people that you want to connect with and that you engage with, then it's super easy to keep working, growing your network with acquaintances, peers, like people that know each other. Like, and and then you start to see okay. Now I'm tapping into something, right? Like, and for me, I mean, I've been on LinkedIn for not that long, but it's just like, you feel like you're getting to find your place, right? And if we can replicate that to real life experiences with in-person events and just, you know, conferences, masterminds, whatever you want to call it, like just 
all this stuff that B2B spends millions a year on and that <laughs> clearly it's not working that much. Like just, you know, give it a twist <laughs> basically. Yeah, but literally a twist, like switch yeah. up the couple of nails. I don't care what you're doing. Like give it a twist, but like do not have, I don't want badges. I don't want any of it. You need to go ask somebody what their name is and what they do, because that's where conversations like people get intimidated by titles. Like don't be intimidated by a title when you see like, Oh, founder, da, 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 da. And it's like, I can't go talk to them. Oh yeah, you can because they fall asleep without their title, and so do you. So like, who gives a shit? Nobody should. So stop it if you do. And it should be like, hey, here we're in. So like in Pavilion, I'll do the Tampa networking events, and so every like third Thursday is when I try to do it, and it's it's a third Thursday. We did it. We were messed up, so we did it two weeks. No, last Thursday I believe, whenever it was. And like twenty five people show up. And there were some people that I had never met before and they were, some were members, some were not, but we went to this really cool, like outdoor area in Tampa and it was super fun. Like it was just like getting together. Who are you? There were, I mean, me being in charge of it too. There were no name badges or anything. It was like, go get a drink. Let's sit and hang out and chill. Let's just talk and hang out. So it was like, people were there like three hours and everybody just hung out. It was great. And that's the way it should be. And that's community outside of the community that I, you know, I'm already in. So some people already being in the community, but also people in my vicinity and my area, the, that community too. You want to make more sales, go grab some drinks with uh, the <laughs> department that you're selling in. So that's it. But just a, as I said before, wrap it up and whatnot. I want to know like what companies would you put in the spotlight right now that are doing a great job uh, with GTM, social, community growth, new bound, partner, everything that we just talked about in this interview. Who's an example? Most importantly for the companies that want to learn and want to see it in action, want to see it happening. You mentioned Chili Piper throughout the interview, but I want to know, like, I have a lot of mine, but I want to know yours. Like, who comes to mind when I when, when we mention, like, comp companies most specifically? If you want to mention someone inside that company that is doing great work specifically, that for sure, but yeah. Let's give Enterprise HubSpot. They are killing it. HubSpot is killing it when it comes to the human aspect of things and the self-awareness as a whole as a company and making moves towards realizing that partnerships are a massive part of their ecosystem. Leveraging co-selling motions too is so huge. Being able to tap into those and being able to sell with your partners, like that's a huge thing that they're doing that like, I'm like, whoa, I need to be involved in that. I look at companies like, I mean, you also look at the PEs or VCs, like I think GTM Fund is doing amazing when it comes to their portfolio company and also enhancing the job boards that they have with the portfolio companies that they have that there's a vetting process and all that. It's like they're doing really great with also having some of the people within those companies on their podcast. So it's like evangelizing what it is with these companies through them being, you know, a part of their portfolio. And then I look at, I look at, then you go, let's go down, you know, lower. Let's look at SynSpark. Like we mentioned video. SynSpark is doing a great job with their go-to-market motion with partnering. They partnered with HubSpot recently, which is huge. They also, so then they also have the right people who are on their, you know, advocates, advisory board, all of that. But they're also saying, hey, here's your license. Go play with it. Give us feedback. Also, let's. Will you be a part of our ebook that we're doing? Share some tips, tricks, so on and so forth. So they're helping the people that are being not just influencer marketing, but showing up on their behalf because they believe in the product. And talk it, they're talking about it, but they're like, here, let me give you the tools and resources to do so best. And then let's go like kind of a tier up a little bit. Then there's I would say Sendoso is doing an amazing job with their Send influencer program because that. It was, I mean, like I have sales now for free right now because they're like, hey, go and find the right people to go send something to because here's your credit for the month that you have to be able to send things to people because it's a gift and that's what people should be receiving is like something that you can deliver. Like, that's amazing. Like I got cookies that my kids ate for breakfast accidentally. I did not know this morning from Sendoso through Grove Cookies that so like it was, I was like, what are y'all doing girls? Like. But they saw and they opened the box. So I was like, no, I needed to make a video. Literally, I was like, I should have made a video of them eating cookies first thing in the morning to share. Failed on that. But 
it's they're doing a great job. So like if you look at like from you know mass company, great. Here's HubSpot, who is doing a lot of really powerful things right now and very aware of what it is their next best move should be. You look at the VCP side, like GTM Fund is really making strong moves there with their portfolio companies and really helping them grow and get the right people in to their companies where they're hiring. Then you look at Sendoso. They're doing amazing with being able to really activate their influencers or their the people who have strong brands. And then since Spark is doing a really great job of being able to say, hey, here's how you leverage it. Let's do this and show you how to do it and getting people to talk about it all around. So those are just four prime examples, in my opinion, that are doing really great. Love that. And I love that you didn't mention necessarily the companies that I thought you would mention that you're you know, kind of like most close to. And that, I think, says a lot about you because, you know, one can think, well, of course, she's going to mention the ones that she's partnered up with or that she invested in or like stuff like that. It's not, no, I appreciate great work done. And, you know, here are some companies like that's, I love that. Credit so, credit yeah. It's credit where credit for sure, due. For sure, as you should. See, that's where it all comes into play. Like, I would, whenever I've seen things where people like tag me in certain things, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know my name? Cool. Like you're like way above me, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, this is really cool to see. You, you know, fruition comes when you show up. So showing up for other companies, like even just saying that, it's like, awesome. Let's go tag them when this is done, right? Like, let's just make them known as saying like, hey, people are talking about you, even though you're massive. And my name doesn't matter to you, but yeah. to me, your name matters to me. So I have that with hockey stack. It's just, I love what they're doing, their content. And now, ah, Obaida, his clips with the background music and playing GTA and stuff. It just, oh my God. I was like, damn. Like, it, so like that on my LinkedIn feed, I was like, I feel at home now. You know what I mean? Like, and I don't, I wouldn't even buy Hockey Stack at all. Like, at least not right now. But now that I have, like, with, with clients, so I know we mentioned, we bring it out because it's like, you want a tool for attribution? You're considering this and that? Go look at Hockey Sack, like, you know? And that's just like, evangelism yeah. for free. I mean, I remember Mark, hey. going back to Mark Cosplay, like, he is an advisor for Hockey Sack, and I saw a post that he did. So I saw him at Saster this past year. I was like, Hockey Stack, saw your post. Let's talk. I want to know everything. And so then I see, you know, one of their founders, and I'm like, you, come here. I was like, we got to talk. And I was like, I love what you're doing i don't totally understand but i want to know everything and i was like you mark are a part of this now and he was like yeah what they're doing is amazing and i'm like okay i believe in this dude i believe in like from what i've seen and what i'm hearing and what i'm like just basic of like here's my demo i can just do by myself for five minutes on their website cool that's exactly what i want and hockey sack agreed go check them out y'all shout out hockey sack yeah love that Great stuff. I might need to start going to those events because uh, <laughs> it seems like there's a lot of great stuff there. But either way, yeah, just for everyone that wants to look you up, connect with you, whatnot, Amelia Taylor, of course, on LinkedIn. Anything else that you'd like to promote or now that we're wrapping it up? You know, I will say that right now we're wrapping up, but I am still working on my, at the revenue table. So I'm still working on my, my company here. I am newly on the market when it comes to saying I want to go join a bigger organization and make a really big impact. So I'm tossing that one out there and seeing what happens. When it comes to what I do best, it is very much so customer facing and it is, it's not a box and roll, but that's okay. I think the right company is going to be where I find that home. So, you know, wanting to tap into the partner space too, there's that. So I will leave you people with that also find me on Instagram. I'm trying to grow my network there. So it's Amelia A. Taylor. So go find me there because I want to be able to not just what if LinkedIn dies tomorrow. I want to make sure there's people elsewhere too that I know where they are. So yes, connect with me. Shoot me a note. All the above. Yeah, she's great. You won't regret it, guys. So yeah, pleasure to have you, Amelia. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to the Founder Video Podcast with Will Martin. And we'll see you on the next episode.